This video is brought to you by SailRite. Visit SailRite.com for all your project supplies, tools, and instructions. In this video, we're going to show you how to reupholster a sidearm for a pontoon boat. The old fabric on this is worn out. It's ready to be replaced. We're going to replace it with Eversoft indoor-outdoor vinyl that's only available from SailRite. Here's what it'll look like when we're done. We'll show you every single step to this reupholstery project, including removing the old fabric, patterning for new, and sewing it up. In this video, we're going to show you how to reupholster the side arms for this pontoon bench seat. In a separate video, we show how to do the seat bottom, the seat back, and the base. If you'd like to see videos on that, check out the links in the description below. At the end of this video will be a full materials and tools list that we used to do this reupholstery job. That list will also detail the exact amount of materials that are required to make this armrest. Let's get started. Most of these outside arms are held in place with screws on the inside. Remove the side arm from the base. That's the first step. You can feel underneath the vinyl that there is a foam under there. It feels like a lot of foam here and not so much foam here. There is definitely a foam here. We're going to be able to tell once we get it tore apart. Now we're not going to be using any of these for patterning. I'm going to show you how to pattern for new patterns. So your main goal is to just cut some seams and get it off for now. Now on the bottom it's stapled so we'll have to pull these staples. We're going to take this cup holder out, keep it, we're going to be reusing it again. Now that all the staples are removed, we should be able to pull the vinyl off and it's in really bad shape. So you can see they used silk film over the top, that's in an effort to pull the new vinyl in place and it also is a water barrier so that if water does find its way through the seams the silk film kind of keeps it from getting the foam wet. So here there is a quarter inch foam, polyurethane foam. We're going to use quarter inch sew foam there. At the top it feels like a half inch sew foam or polyurethane foam there and we're going to use a half inch sew foam at the top. So this foam has been glued on to the uh, plastic uh, structure. So we'll just use a putty knife and peel it off. Now usually the foam at the top, for some reason, is just always much more stubborn, as you can see. So, but you just have to work at it until you get it off. If you put a solvent on there, like an adhesive remover, it becomes all gooey and tacky. So I actually just like to use a putty knife and scrape it off a little at a time. Now this foam that's up here, this is not going to cause much problems. It, it definitely, I mean, you can't tell once the uh, uh, foam is put on and the vinyl is put on. So this is about as clean as you need to get it. Next, we'll pattern for the top, but we're going to be using the bottom to do so. We are not going to pattern the top. Why? Well, there's shape in this top and putting pattern material on this top would obviously give us a pattern that would seem like it's going to fit really well. But since we're using a four-way stretch vinyl called Eversoft, it's going to take this shape beautifully and we're going to pattern off the bottom. Now the bottom has no shape at all except for the shape around the entire perimeter. That's the important shape. This shape will be transferred to the top and the four-way stretch vinyl will stretch beautifully around it. So I've placed my canister on top of the Duraskrim pattern material, that's the bottom side that is facing the Duraskrim, and I'm going to hold my marker right up against the can, and I'm going to trace around the perimeter with the marker held up against it, trying to follow the curves. Now we've traced all the way around it. Now, before you do anything else, Label it O-U-T for out. This is the back corner and it's pretty sharp. Uh, that is a little bit more difficult to make, look, to make it look good when it's sharp like this. So what I'm going to do is I'm just going to use this uh, adhesive spray and I'm going to round that corner a little bit more. This will actually make it look better in the end. 
rather than an almost 90 degree turn. Now we're going to cut this out and because I'm using Eversoft, a four-way stretch vinyl, we want this to be pulled snugly. We're going to be taking up a half inch seam allowance, but we don't want to add a half inch to this side and this side. We're going to take away half of that because this is a fairly small panel. So we're going to add a quarter inch around the entire perimeter. And with that four-way stretch vinyl, that will pull this snugly and should give us a perimeter all the way around that equals the circumference of this. So I'm going to cut not on my lines, but at approximately a quarter inch outside my lines. Am I being exceptionally accurate? No, but this really should be close enough. You might want to take a measurement to make sure you're not adding more than a quarter inch, but I'm fairly confident I am not. Now we'll fold it in half and we'll place a mark at the front edge at the center position because this is where we're going to start sewing things together. So to do that, I'm just going to cut a notch in it. That's the center position. We'll use that pattern we just made for two things, the foam and the fabric. This is a polyurethane foam. It's a half inch. It's actually called sew foam. Why? Well, it has a fabric backing on the back side, so if you wanted to sew channeling, you could sew through it and the stitches won't pull through the foam. But it's also excellent for applications like this when you want to pull a vinyl over something that has a slight foam backing. I'm going to hold the pattern material with my hand and I'm going to use my scissors and I'm going to trim around the pattern material, cutting it to the same size as my pattern. The foam side is facing up and the out is facing up. That's very important. We'll be using foam lock spray adhesive. And for now, I'm just going to spray the uh, surface that we're going to apply this foam to. Don't be alarmed if you get it outside the area that you're going to be uh, adhering the foam to because we're going to be putting foam down below as well. But you want to get a good coat on this. Now you want this to be a permanent bond, so you have to get the foam as well. We're spraying on the side that has the fabric backing. Okay, we've waited for the glue to become tacky, and it definitely is on both surfaces. Now, we want to put this on carefully, um, so I, I sort of try, dry fitted it first, and we want it to go on straight. So I know that I want to be about there, and I'm going to put it on gently because I might need to move it around a little bit. Now I want the sides to be even, so I'm siding down it, and I don't want too much in the front or too much in the back. It looks like it's just about perfect the way it is. See, I can still unstick it and move it around a little bit because I haven't really pressed it in place. So I'm pretty happy with this, so I'm going to start adhering it down. I like to start in the middle, or in this situation where the contour is the greatest, and press that down and then work out towards the ends. Nice. Now we've laid this piece on top of a quarter inch sew foam, and this is the fabric side up. So I'm going to spray it, making sure that I have enough foam to come around to the bottom here. And, but I don't need to spray all the way to the edge because then I'd have to put some protective stuff down to keep my table from getting glue on it. So I'm just going to mark a line there. That'll give me plenty to wrap around to the bottom side. And over here, same thing. I don't need to go too much past the top. So I'm going to put a line there. That's where I'm going to stop gluing. Now we'll just apply the glue to the foam and also around the, uh, the structure on both surfaces for a permanent bond. Okay, I'm going to try to put this on straight. This is probably not going to want to move once I get one side down. Hey, that's not bad. Then I'm going to wrap it around here. Then before it bonds permanently, I'm going to make sure that I don't have wrinkles on this side by working them out. 
so here at the joint, what we'll do is we'll wrap it kind of like you do with carpet. Oops, I may have a little bit too much there actually. I don't want, I wanted it to overlap just a little bit. So I'm going to cut some of this out. So we're just going to draw it up to the other side. Now what we'll do is we'll cut through both at the same time to make a totally perfect seam so I don't damage my top foam. part comes out, this part comes out. And now you should have a seam that is butted up to each other pretty much perfectly like in carpet. We want some of the foam to wrap around to the bottom side. So when you do this trimming, because you don't need all this excess, just make sure you have enough that it comes down uh, so it creates a nice edge that is un invisible because it's all on the bottom side. We're going to put a little bit of spray glue here. We didn't get enough glue on this edge because it was obviously on the table. And we're going to put some here and then we'll bond it down kind of like we did here. Don't worry if you get some glue on the outside surface of your foam, it won't hurt anything. Now we can do here where there's corners are pretty large, we'll just cut a little bit outside the corner. That take, takes away the excess and basically makes it almost a perfect layer of foam. This is going to be fine here. Here on these corners. You can cut some of those away too, just a little bit. Like that. Okay, we're going to trim right along this contour with a very sharp razor blade. Don't do this with anything dull. When trimming between the quarter inch and the half inch uh, polyurethane sew foam, try to be careful not to cut into the half inch by accident. We're going to trim around the entire outside just like this, being careful. If your blade gets dull, change it. Any rough edges can just be trimmed with scissors. We already have the pattern for the top. Now we need a pattern for the sides. We're going to use the foam lock spray and we're, going to, we're only going to spray this section at the top here. We need to pattern this edge. So I've cut a piece of pattern material that's not very wide. It only needs to go down so far. Now this won't hurt the foam. We're only going to put it on the outside surface here, but I'm going to coat it around the edge. So the outside edge all the way around so I can stick the pattern material to the foam. I'm going to take the pattern material and fold it in half longwise, and I will start basting uh, with the fold towards the front. It doesn't have to be right at the front because I have excess material. And I'll stick it down just like this, so that I can pattern on that edge. And then I go all the way around it. I've measured from side to side and this is the center here. So now we want to take an L or a square, in this case I'm using the clear acrylic ruler and we'll place it on the tabletop so that it's uh, a 90 degree turn or corner. And what I want to do at the center position is I actually want to strike a line on my pattern material. So this is my straight edge, basically. Okay, this, this is the front edge. 
and we know that our chair is actually going to be inside of here. You can, in fact, feel the, some of the bolt holes here. So let's have that seam be kind of invisible up against the backrest, which would place that seam when we join the two or this piece of fabric together, stop about here. It's not easy to stop it on a corner because then you have to uh, go around a corner as you're joining the seam. So it's better to have it stop on a straight edge like this. So to do that, again, I'm gonna use uh, my clear acrylic ruler at the location where I want the seam to be. And I'm gonna place it on the table so that it's uh, perfectly uh, vertical here and strike a line at that location. Now this line I'm gonna label as my seam. I'm gonna do that on both sides. The Durascrim is uh, basted in place and I need to tr uh, basically trim or draw a line around the perimeter. And so I need to do this consistently. So I'm gonna try to uh, mark at the consistent spot all the way around on uh, my quarter inch sew foam the edge of the quarter inch sew foam. We're gonna do this all the way around. So I'm using some packing tape where it intersected. In fact, I already put one on here. I didn't show you that on film, but I don't really want this to come apart here because this, I want this to be a continuation of the pattern material. We're going to slit it right here on the seam. This is labeled center because that's the center where we're going to start sewing into the left and start sewing to the right. We also labeled it out because we need to know the outside of the pattern material. So this is the highest point up here for this uh, panel of fabric. So I'm going to measure up and then I want to be at least four inches of extra fabric. So it looks like it's 23, 24, 25, 26, 27. So we're going to cut it a uh, height of 27 inches out of our fabric. So I don't forget, I marked 27 inches on the pattern material. We're gonna cut right on that seam line. Now we can take it off. Now we're only cutting on the uh, line that we struck. We are not adding any seam allowance. We have excess fabric going up the height. We highly recommend using a four-way stretch vinyl for a contour like this. Cutting the fabric is next. Okay, we're using Eversoft vinyl. It's an indoor-outdoor vinyl uh, available from Sailrite. It's a four-way stretch vinyl. So this is the width of the fabric. And notice the stretch I can get out of the width. And this is the running length of the fabric. Almost equal stretch in both width and length. And then along the bias, as all fabrics, they stretch there. Notice the beautiful texture of the Eversoft fabric. It's just a gorgeous vinyl that's easy to work with. The vinyl fabric is uh, facing down against the tabletop. The outside surface is facing up. So the outside of this pattern is facing down. That's very important. Notice here at the seam, this is the seam here, that we have it approximately four inches of extra fabric here, and we'll have approximately four inches of extra fabric on the other side. Now we know that the center is straight up and down. So what I'm gonna take is my clear acrylic ruler, and I'm gonna line it up to the bottom edge of the fabric. This is the factory edge. And I'm gonna make sure that that center line is uh, perfectly vertical here. So it's a little teeny bit off, straightened up, there's a little bit of glue on this pattern material, so my clear acrylic ruler is wanting to move around. So that looks good right like that. Now, this is my seam line here. This line, we know, is uh, perfectly vertical as well, but it may not be straight. Uh, the, the contour of the container that this side armrest rests on is a little bit of an odd shape. So I'm going to put my pattern material down on it, but I want to be have four inches of extra fabric approximately. So I'm gonna put it on with this, following this line. There we go. And then I'm gonna strike a line here. This will be my cut line. I have excess fabric. Remember it needs to be 27 inches. We'll measure that later on. But that line is perfectly parallel with this edge. 
because this doesn't fit on the table that well, we're going to put some sandbags on top just to keep the pattern material right where we want it. Then I can pull this fabric down to get to that other end because I want to work on the seam line. There we go. So now here I'm going to add about four inches of excess fabric following the same plane as that edge. So right about there. So it's parallel with this edge. So this is the important edge. We're going to pattern right on that edge. No seam allowance is necessary. And we're going to extend that edge, hopefully following the same plane as that edge, all the way to that exterior line. OK, when I get to the center line, we're going to draw a line here indicating that this is the center. And if you'd like to, you could actually draw a line here indicating that that's a vertical line. That's probably not going to be used, but this line definitely is going to be used. Because we're using sandbags and we placed it on the pattern material, I can move the fabric over and work on the opposite end now. We're extending this line to about 27 inches, which is actually where this cut is. Do the same thing on the other side. We measured from our outside top here at the corner, not at the corner of the fabric, down 27 inches. And we did it down there too. So now we have our straight edge at the exact spot. We didn't show that. And we're just striking a line. So it's 27 inches from here to there and 27 inches from this, that top edge over there to that line. Now we can cut it out on those lines that we struck on the uh, Eversoft vinyl fabric. At the center position, I'm going to create a small little triangle so I know exactly where that center spot is. That way when I get to it, um, I can join the other panel to it. Okay, the outside surface of our vinyl is facing down, so we're marking on the underside, which means the out has to be facing down. Very important. Now we'll trace around this, and we need to make sure that we mark the center position as well which we've created a notch for that. We've already added the quarter inch around the perimeter of this piece. Now we traced around it, but you can also, if you hold the pattern in place, you can actually just cut around the pattern. Um, it's, your, it's a preference. I think it's just as easy to do this. I'm placing the pattern material back down on the bottom side of my vinyl that I've already cut out, mainly because I want to put a mark here where the uh, seam or the uh, panel will be sewn together. Now, is this necessary? Probably not completely because it may, may well be off of these marks, but it's a good idea to know uh, when you get to that point that this is where the seam is intended to be. It may actually be beyond that. It may be less when you actually do it, but we're going to do this just so that we have a reference for it. We're going to do this here and we're going to do it down there. Now that our vinyl is cut to size, it's time to join those two panels together. Okay, now we've flipped the vinyl right side up, and there's our center mark, and here's our center mark on the uh, top panel. So outside surfaces are facing each other, just like this, and the center marks are over top of each other, and we will sew down this side, starting here, sewing around, sewing around, sewing around, sewing around, and when we get close to this point, we're going to stop where, the, uh, where it's supposed to be seamed together, short of that by probably uh, three inches or so. And then, after this side's sewn on, we're going to start again at the center, and we're going to sew this side on. This is a patterned piece. So because it's got a lot of shape in it, you don't want to just start in the, at the uh, edges and sew inward, because then your centers won't be right. But if you sew this direction, then this direction, then everything should be exactly orientated correctly. Now I'm going to set my stitch length to about five millimeters. So it's fairly small stitch length. So again, outside surfaces are facing each other, centers lined up. We're going to sew a half inch. So I'm using the half inch mark on my needle plate and we'll start at the center position.
got all kinds of slow speed control with this fabricator sewing machine. Now, this is a four-way stretch vinyl, so you want to be careful about stretching it as you pull the panel to match up to the raw edge, because it, it will stretch. And if, when it stretches, if you're accidentally stretching it as you make this turn, it, you'll see a little bit of puckers. So you want to try to keep those puckers to a minimum. So you still have to manipulate the fabric, but just be aware that you don't want to try to stretch it too much. As we go around this curb, notice the wrinkles? Usually I cut relief slits in there, allowing the fabric to relax. I didn't do it for this pass, I'll do it for the second pass. Super slow speed control. Love this fabricator sewing machine with the workhorse servo motor. Okay, so notice that I'm not quite at a half inch here. I'm going to take this fabric and I'm going to let it stack up over here so that it, it can actually take this curve a little bit easier. That'll make it easier for me. Nothing's wrong here. I've just got to start correcting for that. Now I'm pretty much to a straightaway. There's a little bit of curve still in this. So as we get to the curve, we start pulling the panel so the edges are matched up as best as possible without stretching it. So my fabric's dipping off the edge of the table again, so I'm going to lift it up here so I can make this next turn without having to fight all that excess fabric. Okay, we're getting ready to go around a fairly rounded part here. The fabric's going to shrink up here on the top because we're taking a curve here. Now, if I need to, I can bury my needle and lift my presser foot and pull the fabric around that curve without sewing. That way I don't lose my spot. So I can kind of, in a way, pull the fabric around, but yet not, I'm stretching it now, but I'm going to let it relax and then lower my presser foot. Now my edge is matched up. I'm going to do the same thing here. I'm going to bury my needle. I'm going to lift my presser foot with my knee lever and then I'm going to relax the fabric to get around this corner. Nice. Bury my needle. Okay, so here's my where I think I'm going to seam it together. And I want to stop short of that because we want to sew around this entire perimeter, then we'll join this up. So I'm going to stop right about here. I'm around the corner, so I'm around the hard spot. And that's where we want to stop to seam the panel. So when I get to this point, I'm going to do some careful reversing, just a couple of stitches in reverse here. There. That should do it. Now that's my stop point, okay? And what we want to do is we want to go back to the center position and sew from the opposite direction. Okay, so here's our center position, but we can't sew um, this direction, so this has to go on the bottom side. So we're going to flip this whole assembly so we can sew that direction. This will be on the underside, the top will be on the underside, and this will be on the top. Okay, now this may look difficult, but it's not. It really is just as easy as what we showed the first time. All right, so here we are. We're going to put this in the sewing machine, and I'm going to sew uh, probably an inch or two on top of my previous stitches and do some reversing here because I didn't lock those stitches in place. So right there, I'm on, right on top of those stitches. I'm going to sew forward, and then a little bit of reversing. We are going to do a top stitch too, so in a way, if it it probably wouldn't give out because the top stitch is going to hold everything in place. Now, when this panel's here, I'm going to put a few relief slits in this 
see how it's curling up? And that usually means that uh, the leaf, leaf slits will let it relax a little bit around this curve. Don't go deeper than your seam allowance, which is for us a half inch. But notice how this panel's all of a sudden relaxing and not curling up as much. That's what these relief slits do. Bury my needle. I'm going to work my fabric around the corner till it looks good. See how the fabric is split open a little bit because of the relief slits? That's nice. And my one panel's underneath here, so I'm going to grab it with my hand so I can start pivoting it around. Now, I don't want to sew any bumps in this, so when you get to a bump like that, just make sure that it flattens out when you sew. Otherwise, you'll see a wrinkle there. So I'm pulling the fabric around. Bury my needle. Now I can adjust my fabric without losing my spot and I can lift my foot if I need to. So, so I'm pulling this panel around, making that corner. So here's my slit. So I'm gonna stop short of that. Um, we're gonna continue sewing to that point. Pull this fabric over it because it's starting to take a shape again. Okay, so there's the slit. I'm going to go a couple more inches. Okay, that should do it. So now I'm going to do it. See, I'm, I'm about two inches away. A little bit of reversing. Okay, we're going to stop at that point and take the fabric out. We stopped short to determine where the side seam goes. We're going to show you how to do that now. So we're obviously wrong side out. This is the top and we're going to lay it so that it's fairly flat on the tabletop. And then these are the two panels that need to be joined up together. So I'm gonna pull them out so that they are basically flaps like this. So here were our matchup marks, and that's why we cut them long. These actually came out to be short of each other. So they, they would actually be sewing together um, so that the, we'd be on the inside but sometimes they'll be long. Um, it's very hard to determine the circumference around a, an object like this that has shape, though we were pretty close. We're probably off by only, how much are we off? Let's see, that much, which is an inch and a quarter off, not a big deal. So now again, as I said before, these matchup marks, they don't mean hardly anything. They just show us where we basically want to stop. So what we want to do is we want to take the fabric and basically from the stitch line, join it together like this. Okay, so, so it's got a nice straight line along here so that when I sew this, it lays perfectly flat. So I'm looking for the junction of where they come together on a flat plane with a panel underneath. And as you can see, it's at that point. Now it could be over to the left or the right, it doesn't matter um, because you're basically determining the cutoff. So we're gonna just put it there. We're an inch away from this seam, which will make it easy to sew up. So I'm going to put a pencil mark there, and I'm going to put a, put a pencil mark here. Okay, so that's where they'd be sewing together. Now, um, what we want to do is we want to um, cut the fabric a half inch outside of this line. Now, don't make the mistake of cutting a half inch over here. You don't want to do that. So you want, to you want to basically cut a half inch away, that's for our seam allowance, which is approximately there, I'm guessing. And you want to do the same thing on this panel. Never do it over here, always go outside of the mark you just made. So a half inch is right about there. Okay, so those are our cut marks, the outside. So what we're going to do to cut that, remember we made this edge perfectly straight according to our pattern that we made. So we'll lay this flat and strike a line and cut off the excess. Okay, my fabric's nice and flat. This is the flap. Remember, this is the mark we want, not the inside mark. We want to cut on the outside mark. 
I'm going to use the clear acrylic ruler, put it on that mark, and then we can use the ruler to determine uh, the uh, straight edge. And the straight edge is based on that line that we cut there. So we want this to be like that. So we're, there's where the edge of the fabric is all along my clear acrylic ruler, right there. And I'll strike a line at that locale. This is my cut line, and I'll extend it. So that one's cut, we'll flip it over. We'll lay the second one nice and flat. Don't go away, pencil. And we'll cut on this line, strike a line, and then cut on that line, just like we did before. So now that we have it cut to the appropriate size, when you do this, and sew a half inch seam allowance, sorry, my hands are in the way, da -da 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 -da, like that. See how it's perfect length here, perfect length here. So now we'll take it to the sewing machine and sew this together. Now you always want to start at the important edge, and that's the edge at the top, because it has to match up to that panel. You may be tempted to start at the bottom because it looks easier, but you don't. So pull this fabric out of the way so you don't sew through your top, and line up the edges, and we'll sew a half inch in from those edges that are lined up. I can feel if any fabric were in the way, I could feel it so I could prevent that from happening. See why we don't start at the bottom? See how we're a little bit off? That's almost always going to happen. Don't let it alarm you. Okay, so this is the only part that's unsewn, and now it should equal the length that's required with that seam. I'm going to lay the um, fold to one direction. We're not going to do a top stitch here. You could do a top stitch in this if you'd like, but uh, it's really not a stitch that's going to be seen, and it really shouldn't be under too much stress after everything's stapled in place. So we're going to start about an inch inside of my previous stitches, and we will do a teeny bit of reversing. Because we are going to have a top stitch here. I'm going to lay my tail. I can lay it this way or I can lay it that way. I'm just going to lay it this way because it's easier to sew over it. And we want to join uh, that stitch to this stitch without any excess fabric or wrinkles. When I get into this stitch, I'm going to do a little bit of reversing here. Okay. Next, we'll add a top stitch, making a semi-flat filled seam. Okay, before I do my top stitch around the top here, take a look at these wrinkles. That's normal because the fabric is having to take a turn, but cutting some relief slits in that can actually help with our top stitch. So anywhere that the fabric is wrinkled up like that, cutting a few slits like this can make a difference in how that top stitch looks because the fabric will basically fold over top of itself like you can see here. So now there's very few wrinkles at all. So anywhere that's around the perimeter where there's some wrinkles, I'll just cut a few slits to allow it to relax. I'm going to change my stitch length to six millimeters for the top stitch. Then I'm going to take this assembly and I'm going to turn it right side out. This is the top of my armrest. Now, where do you want the, the top stitch? The top stitch could go in the sides here, and that would look good, and the thread would be uh, probably protected from people that rub up against it. It won't get it braided as much. But the water would run down here and collect in this possible uh, flange. So, but if you put the top stitch on the top, then the water would go down like a shingle and hopefully not collect as much dirt as well. So I'm going to put the top stitch on the top side. Now it is true that you know people are rubbing against it all the time. You're always rubbing against the thread and it could have braid over time. But I think I would rather have water run off and I'd rather have dirt hopefully not get caught in the seam. Whereas if it's like this, water and dirt will catch in there and it could uh, be black there. So I'm going to put the top stitch on this top piece and that means my half inch tail is going to be folded to this side so that I'm sewing through the half inch tail on the underside. 
I'm going to start sewing my top stitch right here where the seam is. So we'll do a little bit of reversing here and sew around because this is probably the most least visible spot. I'm going to lift the presser foot with the knee lift and then use the locking lever in the back to keep that presser foot up. Now this looks like, how in the world is he going to do this? Well, the best way to do it is just to start feeding your fabric in there slowly without getting it uh, hurt on anything until you get to that top plate. Okay, I'm there to the top plate. But remember, I wanted to start over here where that seam is, so I'm going to manipulate the fabric to that point. And I'm going to put my hand underneath to make sure the fabric is flat at that point. Almost there. This looks difficult, but it really isn't. I mean, it, every time I do this, it's like, oh, that's really intimidating. But it's not. It's just working the fabric out so that it's not in the area you, you want to sew. The only panel that's in the area you want to sew is what you want to sew. So we're at the general location where I want to start sewing. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to kick the knee lever to the right and release the lever lock in the back. Now I'm using the knee lever to lift the presser foot. And I'm going to put my stitch approximately an eighth inch away from the splayed out section. So I'm going to pull left and right and I can feel easily that the tail is on this side. Now there was that side there. I'm going to sew through the tail. Um, you can also feel if you had excess fabric underneath there, which would be a big no-no. Uh, I do not. I can feel there's just one layer here and the tail's here. So I'm going to put my presser foot down and I'm going to use the foot as a guide to keep it at a consistent distance around the perimeter as I sew. And I will do a teeny bit of reversing here to make it look good because this stitch is going to be visible. So about two or three stitches in reverse. And I'm going to splay the fabric and feed the assembly slowly, stopping with my needle buried to make adjustments because I'm starting to go around this corner. And I'm going to try to keep my hands out of the way. I know that's difficult for uh, this kind of application. Um, but just splay the fabric out and go slowly and work a few inches at a time. When you stop, make sure the needle's buried like it is here. Then I'm going to work this fabric out. So I'm starting to go around that turn. And I'm going to make sure that I feel in here that uh, the tail's on the right side, and it is. Okay, I can feel my tail. I'm sewing through it. Pulling my fabric left and right. Going to check my tail on the underside. It's good. I can feel it right here. That's probably the most difficult area right there at that corner. That was the sharpest corner we had. Stop with my needle buried. My tail splayed out this direction. Everything is nice and flat. Splayed out nicely. Keep ball on the edge. Stop with the needle buried, do it again. You can feel the fabric. There's only one layer here. There's a tail here. My cameraman Seth said, why aren't we using the right edge guide foot for the Sayrite Fabricator sewing machine? It's excellent for sewing top stitches like this. We should have done that, but it's also a good idea to see how a standard foot works to sew a top stitch like this. So I guess we could have made the job a little bit easier by using that right edge guide foot, but we didn't. If you'd like to see what we're talking about, check it out at the Sayrite website. Type right edge guide foot in the keyword search. Feeling for the tail on the underside, making sure it's splayed out and going the right direction, it's not right there. Now it is. You can feel everything right through the vinyl, which is really awesome. This Eversoft vinyl is really nice. Okay, we're almost to the point where we started sewing, so I'm gonna clip my tail on the top side 
and I'm going to sew over those stitches and do a little bit of reversing and then we're done. That is it. In this chapter, we'll staple it onto the base, install the cup holder, and screw it onto the frame. So this is silk film, and it will make it easier to pull our cover on, and it also is a water barrier to help uh, keep the foam dry. So I'm gonna cut it to size. Now it's center folded. So I'm going to unfold it after I have it cut to size. Okay, so now it's spread over the whole thing. You might want to consider putting another layer on top. I like doing that because that's where it's going to receive most of the stress. So this is my front edge, so I'm just going to grab it there and work it on towards the front. The silk film sure makes it easy to pull vinyl over foam like this. Should be a nice tight fit, looks like it is. This side armrest has a lot of shape at the top. Now, would I attempt to do this without using a four-way stretch vinyl? Probably not. A four-way stretch vinyl will take that contoured shape a lot better than a standard marine vinyl that is not a four-way stretch vinyl. So I probably wouldn't even attempt this unless I were using a four-way stretch. What we wanna do is try to get this centered and left and right on the top. And then we'll pull it completely down. And I think it looks like it's pretty centered as far as what I can see. That looks pretty good. So now the beauty of the four-way stretch vinyl is I can pull it underneath and staple it and this will pull it nice and tight and probably pull it down by a half inch on each side. So once we're happy with the position, we need to pull tight, and really this is better done with two people. So I'm gonna pull tight from the back first. <clears throat> and I'm gonna put a few staples in here. I don't like to just put a couple staples in there because the, the vinyl's under a lot of tension just by those staples alone, so I like to put three or four staples in there. This little wrinkle, no big deal because uh, this is taking a curve. We can just flatten it out like that. That's not going to be visible. We'll put a little wrinkle here or distribute a few little wrinkles. More, the more wrinkles you make, the, the less obvious they are. But I think before I do that, I'm gonna start working on the front. So now I'm at the front after I've got the back secured and that should pull out nicely. So I'm gonna turn it over. <clears throat> and I'm gonna put bejeeber amount of force on this. Now this silk film's making it hard for me to pull and it doesn't need to have silk film on the bottom, so I'm gonna cut some of this away. There's no reason to have all this excess here. So this is the front. I'm gonna grab the fabric and I'm gonna pull like crazy. <clears throat> We're stapling this assembly together with the Serite Upholstery Staple Gun, a great staple gun at a great price. One of the advantages is that it takes a half-inch crown staple, and that half-inch crown staple does not easily cut through the vinyl fabric when stapling. A pro tip is to never push down hard on the nose of the staple gun as you staple through vinyl. Pushing down hard on the nose of the staple gun can cause the staples to come through the vinyl. Make sure you're happy with it. If you have to, you can remove the staples again and redo it, if, I mean, if you're not happy. <laughs> 
So I have a slight uh, bump here that I'd like to work out. Sometimes just by working it backwards, you can pull the vinyl pretty tight and get things like that worked out by going like this. And then once it's tight, you can apply a few staples there. We'll get to this corner in a little bit. I'm going to put a few staples and see what it looks like. Okay, now I'm working on this opposite corner on the other side, doing the same thing. So I'm working with the edges now trying to pull out any excess vinyl. Sometimes working it down like this, I can get uh, excess vinyl out. And then when I get to the bottom edge, I can pull. What I'm trying to do is get a few spots basically down tight so that it's on appropriately. Then I'll flip it and do the other side. So this is the back of our uh, armrest. You can put multiple folds in here, or you can put a big fold in here, but nobody's really going to see this. So it's a, really, a, it's a, your preference. So we could do something like that. Having this excess fabric does not help at corners. So uh, don't cut too much away, but cut, cut some of it away will make it easier for you to make it look nice at the corners. So we have a little wrinkle there, no wrinkles here. I think that looks pretty good there. If you have to, you could remove some of these staples that you put in previously, but I think we're okay here doing this. There, not too bad. So here's what it looks like standing up. I think we're just going to put two like this, which is not uncommon for a lot of uh, upholstered applications, two wrinkles like that. They're not really wrinkles, they're pleats. We're going to fill in the staples along the side, putting each staple approximately an inch or half inch apart, pulling your vinyl nice and tight and then work on the corners and we'll show you what we've got at the end. Here at these front corners I have it stapled here and stapled here. I like to just pull the vinyl and create kind of like two pleats in it. Pull it taut, nice and taut and put the staples in securing that in spots. We'll do the same thing here. We have to get the cup holder in here. And so what I'm going to do is I'm going to try to find the circular uh, place by feeling. I know it's here. So I don't cut too deep. So we know the general location of it. I'm going to cut an X with a very sharp razor blade. 
not going too close to the edges. So I'm going to stay away from the edges because I can always go deeper later. I'm cutting through the vinyl and the sew foam. Okay, that's definitely not going to be deep, deep enough, but uh, we can extend it. In order to keep the fabric from possibly splitting past the stop points, I'm going to put a little rooster feet in it. So two slits at a 45 degree angle to each end. That allows the fabric to be pulled on without ripping right in line with the, with the cut. Once that X is created, we can now push the cup holder into place. We left the foam and also the vinyl inside. It will help to hold the cup holder in place. Now to put the side armrest in place, it in back is even with the base. I like that. We could go through the same holes, but the plastic's already a little bit weak there. So I'm going to drill close to the same hole and I'm going to pre-drill a hole here first. We're screwing our reupholstered sidearms into the base. The base has already been reupholstered. If you'd like to see a video on how we did that, check out the links in the description below. There we go. Once you have one hole, one screw inserted, you can drill holes for the other two locations. And you don't have to worry about it moving on you. And if you'd like, you can always install more than just three screws. Now we'll put the two screws in just like we did here. The sidearms are done, but we have a few wrinkles at the front. We're going to work those out using steam. That's next. This pro tip often works, but sometimes it does not. Sometimes a steamer like this can take out uh, wrinkles that uh, you may not be able to get out. Now, I wanted to show this process. So you can see here there's some wrinkles in it. We're going to apply some steam to it and see what happens. And it does take some time, so don't think it's going to be instant. I'm going to hold this on here and heat this vinyl up quite some time. We're going to show this in triple time. After the vinyl is heated so it's fairly hot, we'll start to use a rag and press on the vinyl, working out those wrinkles or inconsistencies in the vinyl. You also want to keep track of the vinyl. Make sure that you're not damaging it. It's highly likely that you will not using a steamer, but if you were using a heat gun or a hair dryer, it is possible. Heat the vinyl, then use your towel and press the vinyl so those wrinkles are worked out. Okay, so you can see here that almost all those wrinkles are gone for the most part around this perimeter because we're using the steamer. Now you can use a heat gun or a uh, hair dryer, but you do have to be careful not to melt the vinyl fabric. Uh, with a steamer, you're pretty much assured that you're not going to damage the fabric. Uh, with a heat gun, you can actually damage the vinyl. So if you're using a heat gun, practice on some scrap first. Our reupholstered armrest is now complete. Don't go away. The materials list and the tools list is coming up next. It is only through your loyal support that these free videos are made available. Thanks for your loyal support. And be sure to subscribe to the Sayerat YouTube channel. Click the bell to be notified of new videos when they become available. Thanks. As we mentioned earlier, we used a four-way stretch vinyl called Eversoft, an indoor-outdoor vinyl that works great for applications like this. If you have any questions about fabrics or the supplies or tools, give us a call at Sayerite. We're glad to help. To see other full tutorial videos showing how to make the seat, the backrest, and the base for this pontoon bench, click one of the links here. I'm Eric Grant, and from all of us here at Sayerite, thanks for watching.